All right, why don't we get started? Thank you all so much for coming this evening, and I, I really doubly appreciate having such a, a good turnout tonight after having been forced to cancel this event due to uh, the aggressive behavior of Mother Nature last night. So I'm, I'm grateful, and I'm delighted also not only to see so many students, but also a number of faculty here at our Johns Hopkins uh, Student Symposium. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mark Stout. I'm the director of the Master's Degree in Global Security Studies. And uh, today we are uh, going to be doing two very exciting things. Um, one, I will start with the less exciting of the two, but nonetheless still noteworthy. Um, we are overturning long years of precedent and um, are, are abandoning, abandoning specifically the prohibition on Twitter. So we would encourage any of you interested who are uh, on Twitter to live tweet and to discuss, hopefully in a respectful and appropriately intellectual fashion, uh, this evening's proceedings. And we'd also encourage you specifically to use the hashtag GovSymposia14, G-O-V-Symposia, that's plural, 14. Uh, secondly, and um, uh, far more uh, importantly and uh, far more exciting, we're just really delighted and honored to have uh, this evening with us Valerie Plame. Uh, you know you've got a truly important guest when the person who stands up first introduces the person who's going to introduce the guest. So I'm not going to speak further about Valerie. Uh, instead, I will speak about Mark Zaid, who will uh, come introduce Valerie here in a moment. Uh, Mark Zaid um, is a national security lawyer here in town. Uh, and he also teaches, as some of you probably know, our course, uh, Intelligence, uh, sorry, Intelligence, it, uh, let me try this again, Legal Issues in Intelligence and National Security. And uh, one of the great things about our program we like to think here is that you never know what remarkable things your professors have done. And uh, in this particular case, uh, among a number of illustrious clients that Mark has had in his legal career is, in fact, Valerie Plame. So, Mark, if you would come on up and do the honors. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Mark. I, I tell you, given what happened with last night, because we had planned this a few weeks, I completely blame the CIA <laughs> for messing up last night's schedule. You know, there's been rumors that they had some weather making national security power that they could control. And obviously, Edward Snowden didn't get those documents to reveal yet. Uh, unless Valerie will talk about that and, and indicate that he, that he has. You know, Valerie is a typical client that I would normally have. I worked very peripheral on, on her issues. I wasn't fortunate enough to, because uh, I didn't live next door to her, to, uh, to represent her. But she's the typical type of client that I would represent. And you're not supposed to know about her. You know, she's not supposed to be here tonight. She was not just a covert officer with the CIA. She was a knock, a non-official cover, which, because of my own secrecy agreements, I can't go into great details about, but she wouldn't have been affiliated with the U.S. government. And but for a sequence of events that involved her husband, Ambassador Joe Wilson, and his expedition over to Africa and dealing with weapons of mass destruction, and a column in uh, Washington Post, right? Well, New York Times. Where the heck was it? New York Times? Thank you. July of 2003 by Robert, the late Robert Novak that said in passing what probably he never even realized what he was doing, that in passing, oh, by the way, Ambassador Wilson's wife works at the CIA. And from that created this major storm of revealing this covert operative of the agency and a whole political firestorm that only DC knows best how to handle. So it's been an incredible pleasure that I've known Valerie for a number of years and be able to bring her into the class and also offer her to the school. Most of you uh, presumably are old enough to remember what was going on a decade ago when this was all in the news for the most part. Uh, but what I do want to point out is now that Valerie had wrote the book called Fair Game and then became a movie, which most of us cannot say. We might be able to say we wrote books, but not that we were, uh, had Sean Penn and Naomi Watts playing us in the movies. And now she has launched another career, much more in the open, as a fiction writer. And her first book, called Blowback, was published this past fall. And she has a second one coming out later this year called Countdown to Zero. So fall, uh, feel free to please ask her about the characters she has created for this. 
She still has to submit this, as my class knows, to the Publication Review Board at the CIA for permission even as a fictional entity, a fictional work, uh, to make sure that there's no secrets that are disclosed within this book. And we're going to hear a very tantalizing discussion about the NSA and Ed Snowden and wiretapping and surveillance and intelligence activities and then anything else that any of you guys want to ask her about, we'll make sure we have time to do so. So with that, please, Valerie, if you would come up and if everybody would join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Thank you, Mark. Um, it's a delight to be here. I always enjoy speaking to students and especially this group, which is uh, in the thick of uh, what my career was. Uh, I'm so happy especially to be here because in previous times when I have interacted with Mark, my hair has essentially been on fire. One time was uh, before I was to testify before a congressional committee, uh, Henry Waxman's committee. And I was so nervous, I thought I would fall out of my shoes. And another time was uh, hearing the appeal for the case of my book, uh, there, is a, there is a Whole Other Story, at the Southern uh, District of New York. So uh, how nice to be here when I can just speak to you about something simple, like the NSA revelations and so forth. So I'm going to uh, talk about that. And then I want to stop and definitely have time for Q&A, think about things as I go through, either on this topic or anything else, uh, I, I welcome that. So thinking about what we have before us since June 2013, when all the revelations came out, began to come out, from the then uh, uh, Guardian journalist Glenn Greenwald and uh, the documentaria, documentarian Laura Poitras, who started putting out in the public domain the trove of information that was given to them by uh, Edward Snowden because he thought it was an illegal overreach by the U.S. intelligence community. It's been very clear that there's only been one real narrative that has come to us from the majority of congressional representatives, the Obama administration, and current intelligence officials. And it goes like this. Snowden is a despicable traitor. His actions have caused profound damage to U.S. intelligence efforts. Our enemies have all the tools that they need to harm us. Snowden had accomplices in his treachery, and that's not clear whether that was referring to the press or the Russians. There is no hope of any clemency of any sorts for Snowden. Director of National Intelligence James Clapper has requested the return of all the documents. I'm not sure what that would do. And in a final coup de grace, he's really been declared PNG, uh, persona non grata. Uh, in early February, just last month, uh, Snowden gave a major interview to a German TV station. It was an extensive interview. No major US media outlet broadcast it. And every time it's posted on YouTube, it gets taken down. So he, he just doesn't exist in many cases. Before going forward, though, I want to make absolutely clear that this debate is not about Snowden. It's not about his, his uh, uh, movement from Hawaii to Hong Kong and then to Moscow. It's not about his pole dancing girlfriend. And most definitely, it's not about the debate of what camp does he belong in? Should he be the whistleblower? Should he be in the traitor camp? It's a debate about the Fourth Amendment and what is the appropriate balance of security versus privacy in a healthy democracy. I believe that the US intelligence community, by insisting over and over again that they are doing the right thing, end of discussion, is ultimately going to end up the loser in this debate. This failure to seriously engage in what Hillary Clinton has called a grown-up conversation presents what has correctly been called an existential threat to the entire intelligence community ability to operate with the support of the American people, Congress, and the media. The NSA and their supporters insist and defend their actions saying that everything they did was legal. 
But does that make it right? Does that keep us safe? Is it in keeping with our constitutional values? Why does it matter at all? So before we unpack those really loaded questions, I want you to know that I'm speaking to you this evening as an experienced professional intelligence officer. I served my country as a covert CIA operations officer, and I focused on the issue of counterproliferation, especially nuclear counterproliferation. And I tried to make sure that the bad guys, whether they were terrorists or rogue nation states, did not acquire a nuclear capability. I truly love my career, and I was proud to serve my country. But I also speak to you this evening as a private American citizen who's deeply concerned about the unchecked growth of what journalist Dana Priest called top secret America that emerged in the shadow of 9-11. It seems that by virtue of my previous career with the CIA, the assumption is that I automatically decry any spilling of secrets and defend the intelligence community at all costs. People come up to me all the time and just sort of assume that that's, where, that's the square I'm standing in. To say it's not that simple would be an understatement. I speak also as someone who personally knows and understands the overreach of executive power and the consequences of allowing politics to triumph over the rule of law. So let's start with the legal case. Let's take a closer look at the notion put forth by the NSA and what former NSA and CIA Director General Michael Hayden just called the permanent government, that everything they've done is absolutely legal. By way of background, I'm sure you know this because you're a smart group, there is a governing philosophy and concept called the unitary executive theory that was advanced especially under the George W. Bush administration. And it holds that just because the government does something, it is therefore ipso facto legal. Two of its chief advocates in that administration were John Yoo and Jay Bybee. Yoo and Bybee authored several, frankly, notorious Department of Justice memos that stated torture by the CIA was legal because the government said it was so. And you wrote, quote, any effort by Congress to regulate the interrogation of enemy combatants would violate the Constitution's sole vesting of the Commander-in-Chief authority in the President. Just so you step back a little bit, the background to that philosophy, the unitary executive uh, theory, judicial theory, that justified an all-powerful pow executive was first described by Carl Schmitt. And he was a German jurist who defended the legitimacy of the Nazi usurpation of the Weimar Constitution. It was later referred to as the Fuhrer Principle. And in the United States, post 9-11, it's ironically been the lawyers who have led the way in, how shall we say, reframing our civil liberties. A government lawyer tells President Obama that it's legal to assassinate an American citizen overseas, while other government lawyers okays the use of CIA drones to attack civilians in places like Yemen and Pakistan, and that these are not acts of war or war crimes. Some of my best friends are lawyers. Sorry, Mark. But I know that these men, and in fact they are mostly men, make a lot of extremely sophisticated arguments, all the while making sanctimonious noises about saving the Constitution. <coughs> Philip Giraldi, he's a former colleague of mine, CIA officer, international expert on counterterrorism and security issues, wrote, the ubiquity of lawyers and government, including congressmen, distorts the public discourse by narrowing discussions of policy to whether something is legal or not and I think we need to expand that discussion. So let's ask the next obvious question. Are Americans safer today because of the NSA actions? Fair enough. I think for sure air travel is indeed safer, but everyone who's been on an airplane since the last 10 years know that it's come at enormous cost and inconvenience and the creation of a vast bureaucracy. We also know that inspections carried out at regular intervals, audits, demonstrate that weapons are still being able to be smuggled on board airplanes. <clears throat> so the answer to the question, is one safer, really depends on where you are and what you're doing. Let's ask just how many terrorist plots against the United States has the vast NSA data mining project actually prevented? 
General Keith Alexander, head of the NSA, soon to step down, claimed 54 plots had been thwarted due to the NSA's prison program. But details are skimpy, to say the least. This is slightly off topic, but I think still germane to the broader questions, because we've been told that enhanced interrogation techniques, let's call it torture, I call it torture, um, does that make us safer? Because we're told all the time by those in positions of responsibility that torture, and that has in fact made us as Americans safer. Well, how many terrorists were caught because suspects were waterboarded and otherwise abused in secret prisons? None. A Senate Intelligence Committee report on CIA torture took three years to research, is 6,300 pages long, based on a review of more than six million government documents, makes that absolutely clear. Torture did not produce any information that could have been obtained by other means. And no matter what films like Zero Dark Thirty imply, and we can have a whole other conversation on that, torture did not lead to the capture and killing of Osama bin Laden. In fact, to the contrary, as my former colleague Giraldi notes, lying under torture was also prevalent, meaning it produced a great deal of false information that had to be checked and rechecked. So not only was it a waste of time, but it was actually counterproductive in terms of getting at the truth. So let's, for the moment, put legal and moral considerations aside and ask the question of whether the massive NSA spying has helped the U.S. advance our foreign policy objectives. I'd begin by suggesting that those who authorized and carried it out at the highest levels apparently never considered the possibility that an Edward Snowden could spill these secrets to the world and the harsh consequences to our international standing. I think it was an embarrassment waiting to happen. One recent example, of course, was last fall when it became public knowledge that the NSA was tapping the personal cell phone of German Chancellor Angela Merkel. And frankly, with 1.4 million Americans with a top secret security clearance, I imagine many of you here may enjoy that as well. And I think the number was 5 million Americans that have a clearance overall. Is this a surprise? Is anyone's? To the contrary, my surprise is that it hasn't happened before or more, off, more frequently. Chaz Freeman, who some of you may know, he's a former ambassador, highly respected statesman, recently said at a panel convened at MIT, by alienating our foreign admirers and supporters, we have weakened our country's political influence abroad. By hacking into our great information technology companies to create Trojan horses, our government has spread distrust of U.S. products and services and damage the competitiveness of our economy. By belying the decent respect for the opinions of mankind which we inaugurated this nation, Washington has catalyzed a global loss of confidence in the righteousness of American leadership. That's a pretty harsh assessment from someone that I admire and I think is frankly brilliant. Without question, it's a harsh world out there. It's a dangerous world. There are many who wish us deep harm and present in many cases truly existential threat to our way of life. Therefore, our ability to intercept, capture, and decipher these communications is invaluable, but it coexists uneasily with a free and democratic society. There are those, those who have authorized the spying are for the most part patriots. They want to defend our nation and don't see their actions infringing on our civil liberties. They never do anything like that. But you have to ask, what kind of structures are they creating going forward? We now know, what are we, not almost nine months on from the first revelations, the pervasiveness and the robust capabilities of the NSA apparatus. It's truly a technical marvel, right? What they can do. And I just heard just a few days ago that GCHQ, the, uh, the British equivalent of NSA, uh, was pulling up Yahoo conversations between you know, all over the world, millions and millions and millions. As it turns out, <laughs> most of them are naked people talking to other naked people, and it wasn't very <laughs> useful. But that's, that's another thing. 
more seriously, I want to know with that vast technological achievement that the NSA has put forward, how come we're not scoring foreign policy points right and left? How come it took us so long to figure out who fired the chemical weapons in Syria? Why do we keep hitting Afghan or Yemeni wedding parties with drones? And I am truly not being glib. It seems that the trauma this country experienced from the attacks of 9-11 was such that the response to it was essentially keep us safe at any cost. I think in many ways it was a form of mass hysteria. And those hungry for power quickly moved to exploit the moment. Once the specter of national security is raised, you can be sure that most judicial rulings and historical congressional checks and balances melt away. It is the very essence of Cheney's 1% doctrine. And for those who don't know, that was the title of a book by Ronald Suskind that it was brought to the uh, fore uh, when, uh, under the George W. Bush administration, Cheney assessed the, che the terrorist threat and the U.S.'s reaction. In other words, if there was a 1% possibility that terrorists would seek to harm the U.S., we would treat it as a certainty in our response. And that has colored so much of what we've done since then. It seems to me that the lesson of Snowden should be that the grand bargain of security versus privacy has broken down, and oversight is simply not what it should be. For example, it's clear that the FISA court, as an institution, seemed far better suited to handle individualized warrant applications under the pre-2001 FISA world than it's been reviewing mass and programmatic surveillance under Section 215 of the U.S. Patriot Act. I wholeheartedly agree with Steve Vladek. He's a law professor at American, and he wrote that whatever surveillance authorities the government is going to have going forward, we need to rethink the structure of oversight, both internally and within the executive branch, and externally via Congress and the courts. It's not because the existing oversight and accountability mechanisms have been unlawful. It's because so many of these disclosures have revealed them to be inadequate and ineffective. With very few exceptions, such as Senators Ron Wyden or Mark Udall, or even my own senators from New Mexico, uh, Tom Udall and Martin Heinrich, there have been very little pushback whatsoever against the steady expansion of snooping on Americans. Indeed, the very members of Congress responsible for intelligence community oversight profess to be shocked, shocked when they learned about the scope of NSA's eavesdropping on both American and foreign leaders. The president claimed ignorance. So whether these political postures reflect dishonesty or incompetence is not clear to us as the public yet. I do, however, think it's fair to say there's been a massive ongoing failure by our government to conduct its intelligence activities in a manner which supports our liberties and constitutional values and our alliances with foreign nations. Um, I'm sure many of you here, much more in this room than other places where I speak across the country, you know exactly who General Keith Alexander is. He's the head of the NSA. He'll be leaving shortly, as I mentioned. And you, in fact, might recognize him if he walked down the street because of who you are and where you live and work. But I can tell you, you're a drop in the bucket compared to the rest of the Americans. But his power and influence and reach is tremendous. There has never been a more powerful person in that position. He's a four-star army general and his authority extends across three domains. Besides the NSA, he's the chief of the Central Security Service and commander of the U.S. Cyber Command. He essentially has his own military at his fingertips. And in his telling, the threat is so mind-boggling huge, bogglingly, huge that the nation has little option but to eventually put the entire civilian internet under his protection, requiring tweets, which you might be doing right now, and emails to pass through his filters. And what he said at a conference, <clears throat> excuse me, in Canada in June of last year, he said, we see an increasing level of activity on the networks. I'm concerned that this is going to break a threshold where the private sector can no longer handle it and the government is going to have to step in. It's another way of saying, we got it, trust us. Don't ask too many questions. 
So when these programs first became public knowledge in June of last year, it seemed at first it really rated, frankly, a huge shrug from most Americans. Uh, there was much more interest in Snowden's private life, his girlfriend. He was, once again, the shiny ball that the media was chasing rather than the real issues underlying, underscoring everything. My friends, probably yours, didn't really understand what was happening and what was at stake. I can't tell you how many people have said to me, I'm not a terrorist. I don't care if the government sees anything. I'm just, you know, chatting with my friends, ordering our pizza. It doesn't matter. I don't care if the government sees all my communications. And I have to say, here we are in 2014, and privacy seems like such a quaint notion, doesn't it? It's like sock garters and three martini lunches. It just is something that we've left in the dust. We have become so accustomed to, for instance, you order something online, say from Amazon, and if you've ordered a certain type of loafer, next thing you know, those ads for loafers or sandals are keep popping up. If you like this, you'll love that. And certainly, I'm a mother of 14-year-old twins that uh, don't you know, leave their phones far behind at any moment. So I am very much immersed in that world of non-privacy. And frankly, most under the age of 25 simply don't under pri understand privacy in the same way as older citizens because of the huge rise in social media that we're seeing. So the question is, like, what's the big deal? Come on already. Here's the big deal. History teaches us that the accumulation of personal information about law-abiding citizens carries tremendous potential for abuse, including, of course, harassment of minorities, political enemies, social activists. Let me give you a couple examples. Chicago Tribune journalist Will Potter just gave a TED talk about the time not too long ago he joined a group in Chicago uh, outside of his job as a journalist for the Tribune to leaflet a neighborhood about animal testing, something he felt strongly about. He just was handing out leaflets to his neighbors about, you know, don't let little bunnies be used for cosmetic testing purposes. Shortly thereafter, he received a visit from two FBI agents who told him that unless he helped them by becoming an informant and investigating protest groups, they would put him on the domestic terrorist list. And if any of you have had the misfortune that to share a name with someone already on that list, you know what, you know, what circle of hell that is. Just two weeks ago now, I think, the New York Times reported that a white shoe reputable law firm based in Chicago was monitored by the NSA while representing a foreign government in a trade dispute. It's not clear to me, from all the reading I've done on this, that there is any leak to keeping us safe from terrorism, as we're so often assured by the NSA and administration off officials as rationale for their actions. So, okay, if it's not a terrorism link, then what is it? Is it perhaps um, commercial espionage? Should I remind you that uh, just the National Security Advisor, Tom Donilon, who just left, excoriated China for doing just that? And then you get into the whole debate of who decides the winners and losers in international trade. Are, are we going to do like what China does and make sure that China's on the winning side of that equation? I don't know. Just last week, Guardian writer Luke Harding was working on a book about Glenn Greenwald. It's out now, but he just recently went public with the strange happenings to him on his laptop as he was putting his book together, the things that occurred. This wasn't just once, it wasn't just twice, it was several times. He would be writing paragraphs that either pertain to what the NSA was doing in Silicon Valley or in disparaging of NSA, and the paragraph started self-deleting. Okay, maybe it's a coincidence. By the way, you may have seen that journalist Glenn Greenwald and, and, his, and documentarian Laura Poitras who, as I noted, initially broke the Snowden story, they just won the prestigious George Polk Award for their investigation. And they live in Brazil and Germany, Germany, respectively. And I was so sad to read that they're both afraid to accept their awards in person because they feel 
prosecution from the U.S. government for their work. That says a lot, doesn't it? So I don't think it's so difficult to, for any of us here to envision a scenario where any of us has a link of a friend of a friend of a friend that's, that that distant, you know, six degrees of separation might have a terrorist link. Being a terrorist, maybe they live in the Bacaw Valley. What then? You have no idea who this person is, but a supercomputer in Fort Meade, or very soon, maybe it's operating now, the Utah Data Center, just outside of Salt Lake City, um, they will have made this connection. And the next thing you know, you've got a lot of explaining to do to the prosecutor at your door. It's the potential for abuse. During his remarks on this very issue in January, President Obama reminded us of the Soviet bloc during the Cold War, where neighbors routinely spied on neighbors. And it's a cautionary tale. Is this who we are or who we want to be? Is that what it takes for the price to be safe? I'm going to return to a quote from Chaz Freeman, who is so smart, and I can't improve on his wording, so I just have to quote him. He writes that the United States was founded on the principle that government is best that governs least. This concept of limited government is wholly incompatible with the notion of an omniscient executive, still less one that is protected by secrecy from both accountability and the checks and balances imposed by independent judicial review, congressional and public oversight, or even common sense. Yet we can be in no doubt that our fear of foreign and domestic terrorism has caused us to nurture just such a governmental leviathan. I'll wrap up by saying I just I saw a metaphor and I just thought this was so apt and it said that the American body politic is suffering a severe case of autoimmune disease whereby our defense system is attacking other critical systems of our body. And people who I respect deeply will argue that if we do not ruthlessly expand our intelligence capabilities, we will suffer terrorism and defeat. So they say whatever minor tweaks are necessary, the core of the operation is absolutely necessary and people will die if we falter. And no one wants to be on the wrong side of that equation, right? But the question still remains how much of what we have is really necessary and effective, and how much of it is bureaucratic bloat resulting in the all too familiar dynamics of organizational self-aggrandizement and expansionism. You all live in Washington, you know something about that. And I'm gonna close on a quote from Senator Frank Church. Uh, as you know, the Church Committee was named after him. He himself was a target of NSA and spying. And this is what he wrote back in 1975, and I can't improve on it, so I'm going to bear with me. I'm going to read it, and then I look forward to opening it up to you for questions. And he wrote, again, back in 1975, that capability at any time could be turned around on the American people, and no American would have any privacy left, such as the capability to monitor everything, telephone conversations, telegrams, 1975. It doesn't matter. There'd be no place to hide. If this government ever became a tyranny, if a dictator ever took charge of this country, the technological capacity that the intelligence community has, given the government, could enable it to impose total tyranny. And there'd be no way to fight back, because the most careful effort to combine together in resistance to the government, no matter how privately it was done, is within the reach of the government to know such is the capability of this technology. And I don't ever want to see this country go across that bridge. I know the capacity that is there to make tyranny total in America, and we must see it that this agency and all agencies that possess this technology operate within the law and under proper supervision, so we never cross over that abyss. That is the abyss from which there is no return. And in those words, I see that uh, Senator Frank Church definitely absorbed the lesson of George Orwell's 1984. And we still need to have a very robust, full conversation on this so we understand how we're going to go ahead as a democracy and as a society. Thank you for your time, and I really look forward to your questions. Thanks.
Oh, come on. Just a comment. Can I get the mic here since we're taking it? I don't normally like this speaker. <laughs> Neither do I. But I would make this, why isn't there a counter argument? If the government was doing this to save lives and to protect us from terrorism, what about gun control, better health care, <laughs> transportation, bridges? Why isn't there anybody seeing through this argument? I sense that that's a rhetorical question. Right. No, it is. I mean, it is. Why isn't there smart people <clears throat> bringing these things up to see through the smoke? I will just. I speak now as a resident of New Mexico. I am far outside the Beltway. Okay, and um, maybe you here, maybe you follow this more closely. But ever since this issue has come out, it has seemed so. As Mark and I were speaking this afternoon very paternalistic in its, you know, just don't ask too many questions, trust us, we know what's best, and how dare you question. And I mean, I, I don't want to go in into the debate of that. That's a whole other conversation on gun control and health. Uh, sure, yeah. yeah. But it's an argument against, I mean, I have Clarence, I, you get that Doberman pincher of, hey, oh, I don't ask questions, just trust us. Mm -hmm. It's not the case for human beings. Well, uh, I am hopeful, you know, the fact that Obama had to address this um, and we've come so far was to my, a step in the right direction. We're starting there. Be and I, I don't want to be drawn into that Snowden whistleblower traitor thing, but I will say this, we wouldn't even be having this discussion if it were not for what we know now. And it makes, uh, we need to have, it seems to me Senators uh, Wyden and um, Udall, as I mentioned, they've been jumping up and down, like with a gag in their mouth for a couple years now. And no one has paid them any mind until finally it became so obvious in, in the last nine months that these things were happening, we need to review them. Uh, for sure, this country changed profoundly after 9-11. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, so you, you had mentioned that um, you know with this new generation kind of coming up, people have less of a worry about privacy. You know, we have uh, social media everywhere. People post things all the time mm -hmm. that maybe you wouldn't know even ten years ago. Um, what do you think that that kind of evolution, what kind of change might that have on public pressure uh, for lawmakers to? really care about this as, as an issue in the you know, coming years? I mean, do you think that it'll, people will care as much and so lawmakers may have you know, less of a problem? I separate the two things out, privacy and potential for abuse. And I tried to do that in my remarks. I kind, as I said, I, I, I was being just a little facetious, but it's, privacy is such a quaint notion. I really think if anyone's an entrepreneur there, I think you're, assuring other people's privacy is going to be a huge growth industry going forward. Um, but we've given up so much of that voluntarily already, whether it's you know through our online lives and ordering things online. The big difference is Amazon, I use them, I don't, uh, just as, uh, as the example, and I don't mean to pick on them, but Amazon does not have the ability to bring you or you know, bring you before a court of law or incarcerate you. That's a big difference. Um, and what you're, you know, the technology companies are all in Silicon Valley and so forth, we give up so much voluntarily. So s that piece of the argument is on one side, and what I tried to pull the, some of the threads out was the whole issue of the potential for abuse and putting, uh, putting in place uh, the infrastructure, the institutions, it's institutionalized. Um, I, the couple examples that I gave are small ones, but they are maybe canary in the coal mine. It's frightening. Um, I don't think that that's the country we want to be. That's not who we think we are, um, but it, certain things are in place. Uh, Mark and I were talking this afternoon as well. I think uh, General Keith Alexander was speaking yesterday, is that correct, at Georgetown? And uh, he refused to take uh, questions, but uh, he had a, by all accounts, by what they wrote about, 
his his demeanor was as it has been from the very beginning, uh, which is frankly to say arrogant. How dare you question me? It is absolutely true. When President Obama was Candidate Obama, and before that when he was Senator Obama, constitutional law, he had a whole different view of the world. All of a sudden when you're in the Oval Office, how could you not, if anyone here had that heavy responsibility and people are coming to you every single day with a terrorist threat matrix and go, you damn well better protect Americans, you, you change what you're willing to allow. I, I appreciate that. I think everyone understands that. But things, I, I thought uh, Dana Priest's book, Top Secret America, was so good because it showed how things get in place and there's a certain inertia that happens, particularly here, the Beltway and beyond, uh, the, the military industrial intelligence complex, as I now call it, gets into place and talk about bureaucratic self-aggrandizement and uh, that is not healthy for our democracy. Hi. Hi. Um, what's my question? Um, oh, that happens to me all the time. <laughs> you said in, uh, in your opening remarks that you thought that um, this debate was about the Fourth Amendment. Mm -hmm. I also think it's about protection of protecting classified information. Um, and I think we run the risk of getting to the point where anybody with a Congress can take, pub, take classified information and say, I think there needs to be a public debate about this, or I believe this is illegal. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question is, how do you how do you draw the line? I mean, you take, take for example, there was a former colleague of yours back in the 70s that disclosed the identities of some um, cover mm -hmm. uh, CIA officers overseas, and a couple of them were killed, like the chief of state mm -hmm. station in Greece was killed. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, Dick so Welch. How do you how do you draw a line between what's being done for the public good and actual national security information and use protection? That's a really good question. I would start with the incredible growth that we have seen since 9-11 in this town with contractors. Because let's not forget, Snowden was a contractor, right? Uh, and I, any of you contractors in this room this evening, I do not mean any respect, but the growth has been phenomenal. The estimates are between, we don't know it's classified, but between 60 to 70 percent of the intelligence budget is spent on contractors. That's a problem, my friend. Um, it's a problem because well, I speak as someone who comes out of a CIA. You, I saw, after 9-11, we just saw it, a huge drain of people going out. They had been trained. They had been the experience from the government and then they were leaving you know friday as you well know come back in on monday with a different color badge making a lot more money as a contractor the problem with that besides the ex exponential growth um is what well, we were told a couple things when we were told there was a philosophy that started under president reagan that Government is bad, private sector is always good. It's better, it's more efficient, it's more effective. That's not the case. There have been, in fact, DOD studies that show, without a doubt, uh, contractors cost much more money and are not as effective because at the end of the day we're human um, as the same job being done by a government employee. Another thing that doesn't get mentioned so much, and I think just from my own optic as a former uh, covert operations officer, if I'm out in the field and things go south, I want to feel that I can rely on someone that has that I know for sure whose loyalty and paycheck comes from the U, from the U.S. government rather than from a huge contracting firm, because if it all goes bad, he'll be whisked out and you know get a job someplace else. You understand? I hope you understand what I'm saying. Um, so your your question's well put. How do you do that? Well. Five million people, if that's the correct number, five million people with a security clearance? Really? 1.6 with a, at least a top secret security clearance? Um, I have to tell you, you, you might not know this because you, you, you're here, you live here, and, and you know it's the fish in the water. It's like, you know, what water? But um, so I moved from Washington, D.C. to where we are now, Santa Fe, New Mexico in 2007, and I come back couple times a year for various reasons to Washington. It is booming. 
it is absolutely booming. You don't need me to tell you you can't find a parking space. It's hard to get a restaurant or a reservation in a restaurant, you know, the swanky one, uh, the cranes in the sky, the new multi-million dollar homes. It, this place is booming, folks. If you go anywhere else in the country, you understand why the rest of Americans are going, oh, they just don't get it in Washington, do they? I mean, no one's real estate values have, I say all this not as a rant, but simply because this is a sort of a hermetically sealed environment here where those things that are really important here of how much power do I have? How much, how many people, what, how big is my budget? You know, the government thing of if you don't use all your budget this year, we take some away. <laughs> yeah, well, that's not exactly the most efficient way of doing business. So, and it, it grows and grows and grows. And I have seen this, I mentioned that I moved away in 2007, just before the big financial meltdown was 2008, 2009. Um, this area barely felt a dent in all that. In fact, it continued to grow and grow and grow. And this is a long, maybe convoluted way of saying that looking, answering those questions of, you know, how, how do you keep things secret is really evaluating what needs to be secret. I'm sure many of you here that perhaps work for the government have occasion to handle classified information. You know how much easier it is to classify something secret rather than actually evaluate it. No, this is administrative. No, no, everything's secret. And then even more, you know how the, the joke was that if you wanted to keep something secret, you just put administrative on it. Because who reads that stuff, right? <laughs> You know, it gets tossed in the pot. But that's the truth. Uh, and it, it grows and grows and grows. Till you have, um, in fact, what Mark and I were saying, our surprise that, in fact, there haven't been more leaks. Um, again, again, I don't want this debate to be about Snowden, but he and how he could have done it differently or what he should have done, could have done, and so forth. But I'm just surprised it hasn't happened before. <clears throat> so I'm going to go in a slightly different direction. In in 2002, as hopefully everybody there knows, you were you were outed in uh, in your status as a CIA uh, operative and became a pawn in very large political games here in Washington. I'm just curious, and I'm and I'm sure that that was a fairly traumatic, difficult time in your life. Um, I'm just curious if you think the Valerie Flame of 2001, so before that happened, I would have had the same views. Mm -hmm. um, on, on these NSA issues that we've been talking about, or if that you know, was a turning point in your life in terms of mm -hmm. trust in the government or sort of uh, you know, mm -hmm. your view of, of, of the power of the government and the intelligence community to, to, mm -hmm. do, uh, to do ill as well as good. Sure. Um, I was actually outed in July 2003. Okay. Um, I would say, like all intelligence officers and military officers, uh, State Department, when you serve overseas, you serve as an American. You're not serving as a Republican or a Democrat. They're partisan. I mean, of course, I had my own moral compass and my own uh, views of the world. But partisan politics never, when you're overseas, it really doesn't enter into your vocabulary. And I would say, and I, I, um, I am, let me be very careful here. I'm not a, permitted to acknowledge any agency affiliation prior to 2002. So I would just say, hypothetically speaking, um, prior <laughs> to 9-11, and actually prior to the election of 2000, Bush v. Gore, remember that, um, I never, uh, one hypothetically never remembers um, people discussing what their partisan affiliation was. You just, you, you were an intelligence officer, you're trying to do the best, trying to do good, covert, uh, secure, creative operations. I think it's fair to say that in general, after the election of 2000, followed then by the shock of 9-11, everyone became much more aware of partisan divide for all the, re for the many reasons we know. Um, I come from a military family. My father uh, served in World War II in the South Pacific. He was an Air Force officer, career. Uh, my brother was wounded in Vietnam as a Marine. So I came from a family where public service was considered to be something worthwhile, something noble. And 
uh, I was keenly aware and thoughtful of authority. I think I can say that. Uh, and it's also fair to say that when all of this happened in 2003, and when I was first outed, and then the ensuing fallout from all of that, I had a very steep learning curve in partisan politics, what it's like to be in the media. Um, and it was, it was, there were some, for sure, some tough years there. Uh, and coming to terms with that, I never, ever wanted to be a public person. Uh, I loved my job. I, was, I, I derived a great sense of satisfaction from working on the nuclear counterproliferation issues that I did. And I, I found when I became a very public person and I was reading in the newspaper or seeing on TV or on the radio about these people named Valerie Plame and Joe Wilson that had nothing to do with me, I found it all just terribly mortifying. Honestly, I was in shock really for a couple years to get over that. Um, so that is a good question. Um, about who that person was, who I was, who that person was in 2001. I look back, I was really just, uh, at that time, um, in the run-up to the war with Iraq, I was working in uh, what we call counterproliferation division. I was working in the Iraq task force. I was the head of operations. I was responsible, along with my former colleagues, to try to understand what exactly was going on in Iraq and their nuclear program their alleged program, who were the scientists, what was uh, their state of their R&D, how were they procuring the material, and so forth. My head was totally focused on that, how to run good operations, get people where they needed to be, how to, how to approach someone here, cold pitch someone there. And for me personally, it wasn't until then Secretary of State Colin Powell spoke before the UN in, in fact, February uh, 2003, just a few weeks before we went to war in Iraq, that I experienced what I can only describe as cognitive dissonance, uh, whereby what I knew and understood and my intelligence experience was completely at odds with what General Powell was saying. And it was a terrible feeling. Uh, many of you may know about Curveball. He spoke about Curveball, who had been a thoroughly, completely, utterly uh, discredited source within the intelligence community. It wasn't like three people knew. No, the intelligence community knew Curveball was a drunkard. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Um, and here it was Colin Powell, who had, I had such respect for, and like everyone, you know, we real. I if you if you were uh, old enough, and you weren't just there's a lot of young faces in this crowd. Mm -hmm. um, it was, people turned to see what he would say before the UN because he was essentially selling the world on the reasons, the rationale that the United States was going to war with Iraq. So everyone was hanging on his every word and as his speech unfolded, I was experiencing this sort of pit in my stomach. He was talking about curveball in ways that didn't make sense. Uh, he was making allegations about intelligence that was much more robust than what I had experienced and, and saw. And so after his speech, I went back to my desk. I saw, <clears throat> excuse me, I was working at CIA headquarters and went back to my desk <clears throat> feeling, uh, frankly, just sick. Because it was for me one of the first times I pulled my head out of the operational weeds and I was looking at the broader picture of what the administration was saying versus what was what intelligence I knew to be available. And all I can say at that point was that I was hopeful that the president and his close advisors knew much more than I did. <laughs> you know, I, I'm way down in the food, you know, the food chain there. And going to war is the most important decision that we as a country make. Right? to send our sons and daughters, sisters and brothers off to kill and die in our names. So I, I believed and I hoped that the president must have much more information 
that he had made that decision to go to war because it was only three weeks after that that there was a shock and awe. You talked a little bit about uh, research and development, which is my area. I'm uh, Johns Hopkins' new director uh, for a new master's program in research administration. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, I was senior associate vice president for research at a major university. Mm -hmm. My concern is that this not only extends to uh, the community in general and the military and such, this is also seeped into universities. And there are university regulations that are, are given to us in our grants and contracts that deal specifically with export control regulations. And uh, so far there have been two faculty members convicted of violations of export control regulations when they have left the country and presented in foreign countries. Hmm. Okay. And uh, I wanted to get your input on uh, why you don't address and others don't address this critical need that we have to look and care for our research and to make sure that our research and development is not reclassified by the government uh, upon issuance of any type of report. Because what we currently have is a system whereby we are told that if we receive federal funds that uh, research can be classified or reclassified as dual research if there's any way it can have a military application. Mm -hmm. Not knowing the specifics of the case, I can't make any co you know, comments on, on those abroad, but uh, this is part of a, the broader problem. I looked at this all the time in my covert operations of dual-use uh, goods that were being exported, whether it was uh, trigger spark gaps or uh, uh, other uh, tables that you can use for uh, um, testing missiles and so forth. It's very difficult to make those assertions. Uh, and of course, in biological weapons research, the dual use goes all the way up almost until the very end, when it can either go into dangerous weaponized things or, you know, baby milk, right? As we know too well. Um, so it's very complicated. Maybe one more question? We have time for one more? OK, great. Um, just getting back kind of to NSA and security versus privacy, <coughs> do you have any thoughts about the NSA's recent hire of a uh, chief privacy and civil liberties officer? <laughs> uh, kind of what are your thoughts about that? Will it help you know, separate that balance? Will it help you know, with checks and balances? It's a start. Uh, they've got a long ways to go. I'm not sure if it was uh, General Alexander or it was Clapper who just recently made the comment that, or the admission really, maybe we should have talked more about this publicly uh, and have more transparency and so forth. Um, yeah. Uh, because I, th I think that's a really important piece that is missing. I hope I conveyed to everyone in my remarks this evening, I get that it's a really dangerous world and people truly mean us harm. I, I understand that more than you might give me credit for. I work, you know, I, I've worked with terrorists and terrorists trying to get nuclear weapons, okay? It doesn't get much worse than that. But what is missing from that in this whole conversation has been a paternalistic, rather frankly patronizing attitude of Trust us, we got this. Really, we don't need you to help. And, uh, and the other piece I hope that came across as well is my bafflement, just as a citizen, I don't have any insight, you know, but my bafflement as a citizen to go, why isn't the oversight stronger? Where is that backbone? A little backbone? They seem to have plenty of backbone when it comes to, say, shutting down the government or anything like that. But these are things that go to the fundamental issues of, Fourth Amendment, security, privacy, um, and try to uh, try to make sense of that. So I applaud them. That's the first way to begin. But they have a long ways to go. I found, um, I think it was, yeah, it was Alexander gave a 60 Minutes interview just a few weeks ago, um, and I found it. Maybe I'm maybe I'm just too cynical, but it, it sounded to me like an infomercial. I expected much more out of 60 Minutes. It would talk about, I'm not a lawyer, but it was like leading questions. I'm trying to remember who the interviewer was. It's um, 
He had just moved from CBS. He's gone back into police work now. John Miller, maybe? And he's asking General Alexander, so you're doing this to keep Americans safe, right? You know, and General Alexander goes, yes, John, we are. I mean, really? This is not the type of dialogue or discussions that we need to have. It's useless. It's an infomercial. We need more. I'd, I, I've, I'd like to hear more. I haven't seen that much on what the, what the privacy officer or civil liberties will entail. But uh, wouldn't it have been fascinating if, very briefly, I know you got to wrap up, but, um, you know, President Obama had that, I think, five-member blue ribbon panel to talk about, you know, these issues, and they presented a report to him. And it was, frankly, all the usual suspects that, you know, you knew, you could have closed your eyes and picked who he was going to put on that panel. And they, the, the, and it was a start. I don't, I'm sorry to sound so, um, I don't, flippant. I don't mean to be. But how radical and how exciting it would have been if it had broadened and maybe included people that are really dissident voices, people like Thomas Drake, for instance. Just doesn't mean you have to take all the, but just have their voices heard, have them part of that discussion. That, you know, that's not how we do things in Washington. And, um, but it's, it's unfortunate because uh, if we want to try to regain any sense of uh, mor the moral, political high ground and leadership, uh, many things have to happen, but starting with these changes that I spoke about this evening here at home. Thank you for your time. I'm more than willing to stay and answer some questions.